So, Lord, we look to you. We thank you for every relationship we're in. We thank you for the, our marriages. We thank you for our friendships, our work, where we are, those family members, our neighbors. And we thank you that James wrote at a time when incredible things were happening. Your people were being persecuted, and yet they were extending the love of Christ. So show us today, Lord, where this fits into our hearts and fits into our lives in your name. Amen. And so, as you know, uh, we're going through um, uh, the book of James, and I'm just pulling out of it things that help us to understand the relationships that we share with, with one another, uh, the way that we understand um, how we interact, the things that matter to us, the things that, uh, why they're in the way, why they're an avenue that that relationship could be made better, especially, of course, our, our, our relationship with the Lord, our relationship as a husband and wife, our relationship within the context of a family. And let's face it, we're called to be witnesses outside and everywhere else. So uh, James 2, and of course the notes, if you don't have them, they're in the back. They'll always be on that table when you come in. So James writes this, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there, sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not, is it not the rich who have exploited you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him who, to whom you belong? If you really want to keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Whoa, that's a big chunk to get hold of, isn't it? But it's something for us to understand when it comes to how we how we see one another. So some, I guess probably now, it's just about 30 years ago, I got on a plane to my first mission trip to Tanzania. Uh, Nathan Rasmussen, uh, we've been friends for years. Actually, Nathan was in our wedding party, so we just know each other for a long time. I ended up there in Tanzania. Uh, there were some challenges. Uh, challenges is an understatement uh, in terms of, you know, this is here I am, Mr. Suburbanite, traveling through Tanzania on the back roads, in the, in the bush. And so, uh, so I'm just processing through at 1,000 miles a minute as I normally do. And in my mind, I have, I have to confess, in my mind, I just thought, they are so lucky to have me here. You know, here I am, the Wazungu from the States, you know, the white man from the States. And I am just going to, this is awesome. This is awesome for them. So I don't think I thought that, but I I was living that way. So after I came out of the hut um, in the morning, after I found out that there was no um, facilities there and the humility started happening on a regular basis, we were eating dinner in a hut only to find out that the chairs that we were sitting on were chairs that um, every, every home had one chair and that was the chair of honor. And so the, the father or the, uh, of the house, that was the chair. Everybody else sat on the floor or rocks or whatever. So as we ate, there was someone behind us the whole time, which from, as a New Yorker, that is not a good feeling. That is not a feeling of comfort or that's like, what is going on? That chair was so important that as we moved to any part of the uh, site, they knew that white people don't sit on the floor. The, so um, they just carried the chair with us wherever we went. So if you stopped and you were talking, you could feel the chair right behind you. But then what really completely changed me, and I was so glad this happened right in the beginning of the trip because I was there for six weeks. We were talking, uh, Brother Lenny Maglione and myself, we were traveling together, and we could hear over the top of it. We were, in the, we were a little in the middle of the, of the bush. We had, I had no idea where we were. I had no idea if there were animals around us. All I know is I'm not, I'm not moving. I'm staying right here. 
and I could hear worship. We just knew it was worship. It was in, uh, it was in Kurundi. And uh, as we walked over with our chairs following us, we stood there, and I was immediately on my face because I could feel the worship of these people. And these were all students. They were all students. I mean, it's not students here where you're staying in married student housing or you're staying in a, in a dorm room. These are, these are students that what they gave up to be there, I couldn't even begin to perceive. And we worshiped probably like I've never worshiped in my life. I was pretty humbled when that was all over. You see, when we show favoritism and we, we decide the way things are supposed to be, it separates us from the people that God wants us to connect with. And it, it separates us from the experiences God wants us to have. And that's what James is saying. Hey, this is not just you're better than you. There's something that happens that disconnects us from the relationships that God wants us to have. And so when James writes these words, he says, you know, what's the point? The new believers are scattered and are trying to regroup. The wealthy new believers have clout and value, so they're being exhorted above the others. So here's what's happening. The people are all out, they're being persecuted in Jerusalem, so they're being sent out because, because they're believers, not because they're Jews, because it's the Jews that are, that are persecuting them. So they now are people that are... Um, uh, they're just being abandoned. Their families, if they become a follower of Yeshua, they are separated. The families are, you're dead, literally, and that's what they do. So now, here's this weird thing that starts happening. So first, it's just the people. Now, all of a sudden, people coming into their midst are the wealthy people, or people that perhaps they had worked for, or people that they, you know, worked in their homes, whatever, and now they start also being persecuted because they are also now followers of Yeshua. And the dynamic begins to change. Everybody that's run out there and everybody, they were like, we're all going to work together. Now this guy walks in with gold or he's obviously not one of us. And the whole thing begins to shift. Why is that, why is that a bad thing? It's a bad thing because before this, they were, they were depending on the Lord for their provision. Now, little by little, they're shifting over and depending upon this wealthy person for their influence, for See, so what happens when, when we start living in this, wor this world of, of, being, of, of um, honoring others above, especially when they have something that we can get out of it, what happens is it separates us from the way God wants to work, whether it be in our marriage, whether it be in our business, whether it be in our kids. We start separating from what God is able to do. And that's why what James is writing is it's so important that we understand, you know, if, if you do this, if you, if you do this, he says, you are, um, you are not withholding, you are not uh, obeying the law, which is, which is really about love your neighbor as yourself. Love your rich neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor that you have a lot in common with. No, it's just your neighbor. And, of course, we hear, we hear uh, later on in Scripture, who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? You know, and, and so let's just kind of walk through this. So, so what filters are we using in our relationships? Uh, this is not a suggestion. He says, don't show favoritism. And it's not like it would be really great if you could do, make an extra effort. He says, and when you read something in Scripture that's that strong, you have to say, well, i got to listen to this. I may mean, not really understand it, but I need to listen when the Scripture says, don't do this. It's not up for grabs. It's not up for a debate. We're not going to have a, a council meeting over it. It's just, I need to do So what is it? Here's, here's what it takes to show favoritism. This is just a dictionary definition. The practice of giving unfair preferential treatment to one person or group at the expense of another. There's always a cost to favoritism. Even preferring a saved person over an unsaved hungry per person hungry for the gospel. See, if, if our, and, and, and we need to be, we need the fellowship of believers. I'm 100% for that. But we also need to realize that there are unsaved people there that are trying to get in. <laughs> you know, starting to, hey, well, I want to understand. But sometimes we, we are so focused on just our own uh, believers, our friends, that we forget. And, and when the context of our marriages and the context of our relationships, there's constantly that sense of what matters to you in this relationship. And I just want to look at that a little bit because, you know, it's 
So what happens is the closer and the more intimate, the more we're aware of our filters. The closer we get to someone, we realize you know, that we're making a conscious decision to draw closer to them or not, including our own spouses, including our children. You know, as children get older, they become other people, you know. Sometimes good, sometimes not so much. And sometimes it's really hard, and then we have prodigals that go off in their, in their own direction. So I just made a little list here so we can kind of get an idea. You know, there is social status and familiarity, there's similarity and ease of connection. That can cause us uh, to prefer one over the other. To the needs that are need being met, sometimes we are more attracted to people that are needy. But the idea is, it's not about what we decide to do. It's what God has called us to do. So when we hear in a marriage, husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church, he's saying you need to prefer that relationship over another in terms of that dynamic. Or wives respect your husbands. So let's look at this. He says, so families, the closer the more intimate, the more we are aware of our filters. And so in families, those filters sometimes are history. So instead of drawing close to one another in that family, there's a history marker that stops us. There's that argument that happened. There's this thing that happened, whatever it may be. And that keeps us from, um, from drawing closer. I was with an unsaved person uh, last night, uh, Phyllis and I, and, um, and she just said I, her husband was divorced and had um, uh, you know, children, and because of how divorces are, he didn't talk with his daughter for years. And now they married, and uh, she's uh, very close to her, um, uh, very family-oriented. And she said, you have to resolve this relationship. You have to resolve it. And he was like, no, I, I'm not. It's, not. it's not worth it. We're fine the way we are. But in, this, in their marriage, this was, a, this was a dividing point for her. It wasn't her daughter, but she knew that this had, there had to be a resolve of this relationship for things to be the right way. And ultimately, they did resolve it. And now they enjoy their grandkids and all these other things. So we have to be careful that when we, when we are preferring someone over somebody else, sometimes history of our, of our families do that. Sometimes with our friends, our experiences, good or bad, they cause us to prefer one over the other. And think about how many times your friends, your unsaved friends, it's kind of a, we're kind of a, a, a struggle place, and we have, that's where we have to have the Lord come in and move, is we have unsafe friends that were like, I can't do this anymore. And at the same time, we have unsafe friends that need Jesus. So it's this, this stress of how to go about this. But he says, see, if we prefer our unsafe friends, if we prefer them, and we, we embrace their unsafe lifestyle, that becomes a problem. But if we prefer them in light of knowing that they need to know Jesus Christ and our prayers for them and, and our heart is that they, they might know Jesus, that's very different. So in our, and in our marriages, it's based on, you know, the oneness, uh, the understood standards. You know, sometimes within a marriage, the, the stress point is that oneness point, that point where we're supposed to be together and we're not. And so sometimes we come back to that place over and over again in the relationship where it's sort of that sticky point. It's that point that's just annoying, that just, and it just, we come back to it over and over and over again. And so when, when we're looking at the favoritism, we have to make sure that with, even within the context of our marriage relationship, that favoritism doesn't become a dividing point for us. Because see what happens is if favoritism in a, the big picture becomes the way that we think a marriage should be, that's what we're going to be doing. Instead of, God, how do you want this marriage to be? What do you want to do through this marriage? How do you want to rebuild this marriage? But our favoritism is just, we've got this view of what marriage is. It's going to be this beautiful thing when about midway through, about the first, within the first five years, first three years, you kind of get a feel for what you really think a marriage is. And, and I remember Phyllis and I sat down, and we said, we got a lot done at seminary. I actually got my degree there, too, so in the middle of all this. And we sat down, and we literally had this conversation. What did you think our marriage was going to be? Well, that was a long, sleepless night after that. <laughs> like, like, what? No. What? And, you know, we just felt we were so far from that reality, so far from that reality at that moment in time. So if we, if we give preference to even our own personal history, 
If we give preference to maybe one family or the other, we give preference to, and we don't give preference to what Christ wants to do in our heart and life. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your husband as yourself. Love your wife as yourself. Love your children as yourself. See how this, it's, this isn't restricted to, you know, because what, what do one of the uh, scribes say? You know, well, well, who's my neighbor? Like, can we get this nearly narrow down here? If I'm going to love my neighbor as myself, I know exactly what we're doing here. But it's much bigger than that. It's, it's our neighbors. It's our, our relationships that are close to us. And then professionally, sometimes we can, we can prefer someone over the other just by their skills, just by their skills, and diss somebody else. That God might want us in that office, in that workplace, in that whatever it is, in that profession, because the people that you don't relate to are the people that God wants to relate to through, through you. That's a tough one. But there are people there that you are in your workplace that need to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. But our preferring, our judging, our bringing somebody else, you know, uh, in, a, in a different way in terms of who they are, we block out that group of people. And we can do that in our marriage. See, one of the, one of the challenging things in a marriage relationship, too, is if we are verbally, we don't, maybe not say it, but we're thinking, I really prefer that marriage over mine. I'm giving favor to that marriage over mine. So it goes much deeper. And every time we do that, we take one step away from what God's intended purpose in our marriage is, in our raising our children, in our extended family, in our neighborhood, whatever it is. See, because that's why he speaks so strongly about it. Don't show favoritism in any way that you're thinking. John 13 says, a new commandment I give you, one, love one another as I loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Okay, so the word has to override our thoughts and preferences and, and feelings. And when it says, love your neighbor, love your wife, love your enemies. In other words, see, if we would stop sometimes and realize that every relationship that we're in as a believer in Jesus Christ is a possible avenue that God is using to extend into that relationship or through that relationship. You know, one of the things I shared probably last week or well, somewhere along the way here is um, at the hotel, the Marriott uh, Hotel, it's a fabulous hotel. I mean, just beautiful in every way, and doorman, not doorman, but uh, uh, the, uh, what? Concierge, and, and the people that take care of your luggage and all this other stuff, you know. And uh, I'm, I'm always afraid I'm going to say busboy, and that's probably, you know, some antiquated term. I'm sure there's some term that I'm missing here. Um, and here it is, this beautiful place. Everything is nice and friendly, but, you know, it's a Marriott, and a, a, a good Marriott. So we come in there at the end of last year, and we say to our people, and this, our people don't know it, you're going to know it now. When we sit, we sit with this big group of all the, um, all, this is the head of this, the head of this, the head of this. It's like 12 people around the table, and I'm sitting there with my Starbucks, you know. Uh, so, and, and we're talking to everybody, and, and there's two things that they know matter to me. One is that the food is hot, very important. That's like prior, primary. And the second one is that if there's anybody in our group that is a problem, please let me know. And after the first time I said that, I say it every time, the director or the manager of the hotel said, I don't understand why do you say that. I said, because we are not here just for us. We are here to be a witness for Christ. I'm sure it went, whoop, you know, but that's how I believe. We have an opportunity to affect people. The woman that's cleaning the room, the guy that, the waiter that's serving us, the people that are moving the furniture around, we have a way, and, and the neat part of that is open all kinds of doors with their staff to hear what often does happen in the hotel. And it's pretty frightening to, that people get treated that way. So last year as we were leaving, we came down for breakfast Sunday morning, and there was a big hand-done poster by the staff, the wait staff, thank you Smithtown Gospel Tabernacle for loving us. And they all signed it. That's never happened. To me, that's what this is about. If we just prefer one another, there's our church, there's our Christians. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm all for the fact that we are to love one another and we need the fellowship. But look how God used that in a different way. They're not just the people taking care of the room. She's not just the woman cleaning my room when I'm done. I have an opportunity to share the love of Christ with them. And they see it in our relationships. 
to me, that's really, really important. They, by this, all men will know you're my disciples. By your marriage, your unsafe family will know that you're a disciple of Christ. By the way you parent, your, your family and your friends and your neighbors will know. They know it. They know it. And the fact is, is not only, this isn't just like surprise. This is, this is a statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. By this, all men will know you're my disciples. We need a 12-point plan to reach the world. Well, it starts with two people, one person. The way we love each other is the way people. You know how many people come into our church, and they're like blown away, not because we give them special gifts or anything else. They just don't get it. Like, how could all these people be nice? I, one woman said, I came back the next week to see if maybe it was just a special day. She couldn't believe that that was happening. And we do it because that's what we do. But when they see it and they experience it, they realize we're loving one another and so we're expressing Christ. And so why is it that at not only this hotel, Willow Valley, um, the Holiday Inn, the, we've been in so many different places, why is it that I get probably every time some staff member come up and say, Pastor, can I talk with you? And they begin to share about their marriage or their home or their life. Not because just it's me. It's because this is an atmosphere that's changed. Do you realize in your marriage, when you step into your unsaved family, and they just would love your marriage to fall apart because that would make them validate. And they see it together. There's, there's a... There's a uh, a pressure, there's a, a truth that's being in, uh, brought into their lives as they see your marriage uh, unfold. And so when we look at this and we're, we're understanding, you know, don't, uh, don't get to the place where, we're, where we are um, showing favoritism, even to ourselves. Hey, we're going into our unsaved family again. Please pray for me. See, that's really kind of a favoritism it's only just for Christians, and then those other people that are outside. And we just say, God, take that away and use us the way, every way you can. So the key is overcoming the separation through favoritism and prejudice. It forces us to embrace his healing and experience the power of his word, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Our relationships conform to his purpose and plan and not to our fears and preferences. And let's face it, when we are uh, preferring someone over the other, there's preferences and there's fears. There's fears. Hey, if I get to be a good friend in the early church with this wealthy person, then if things really get bad, I can just scoot over a little closer to them. I could have their table scraps because they're much better than ours. See, so we have to realize if I put my agenda in, I could be very well cutting off. And that includes in our marriage relationships. If I put my agenda off instead of what God wants to do, if I begin to prefer the, the wife of, uh, of another marriage or the husband of another marriage because I think I would like them more like that, like that more like that, it begins to do this exactly what I read. There's a separation through favoritism or prejudice. There's a separation. So, so let me... Make sure you understand this, because if I start preferring the way another wife is as a husband, and not towards me, just, wow, look at the way, look what she does, or the husband, look what he does, my goodness, my husband's a bum, he's out doing all this stuff, what, you be, this separation starts. I am no longer looking at my wife, I'm now looking at my husband, I'm letting this favoritism of a different way become a separation. It's very easy to do. That's why sometimes we have, to, we have to disconnect. When that starts happening, can I encourage you, because we're being obedient, don't show favoritism. To the, uh, uh, favoritism. We have to disconnect from those things. We have to disconnect from those things. And it may be, you know, that uh, you may just now have to disconnect a relationship. Hey, we can't do that anymore. I, I, can we not have them over? It's really uncomfortable for me. If you're a spouse in that case, or you are sharing it maybe even in a friendship, and, and, and that person comes to you and says, this is really uncomfortable, don't get tied up in, oh, I can't believe you're looking at him or her. That's not, they're saying, can we not do this? I, need, I, need a, I can't do this. I want to, but I need help. And if that means disconnecting for a season or forever, then that's what it means. I know these are kind of hard Words, but I, I feel it's so important for us to realize that favoritism creates these, 
these barriers that we don't even realize. Or favoritism too, I wish it was the way it was. Well, it's not that way anymore. Not that way anymore, it's the way it is. You know, I think we all, if you're married, you, you all get to the place where you're like, ah, oh, I remember it was so simple when we just had that apartment. Yeah, Phyllis and I said that one time. I said, yeah, we didn't have any money. And yeah, we had peanut butter and jelly every day. And yeah, no, oh, that wasn't so great. <laughs> that was so great. You know, or friendships. I remember when we had these great friends. Remember, it was a wonderful time. Yeah, but we're not there anymore. So let's just look. So, so relationships birth the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. See, as we start coming into these areas and we understand the things that God is doing, those relationships that we have become a place that birth the things of the Lord. If we're two Christians, be ready to come to a place where God says, I'm going to birth in you patience or kindness. And the neat part, it, it develops within our relationships. It develops maybe when we're at work. It develops when we're with our friends. It develops with our kids, really with our kids, and with, you know, with uh, each other. So when we start looking at these things and, and we have that sense of, you know, not showing favoritism, we, uh, when that happens, see, it's not just what we don't do. It's what happens when we don't do it. That's the key. So when we start stepping away from all this other stuff, and we stop uh, stepping away from maybe a thinking about favoritism to a different kind of relationship I want to have, all of a sudden, now we're open for the Holy Spirit to come in and transform the relationships that we have. So that we are people that say, you know what? I want the fruit of the Spirit in this relationship. I want it with my kids. You know, we're very blessed. We have one, one uh, my, our son and daughter-in-law travel over the world. They just have a new C. D out, which is awesome, I have to say. Some of the early ones, eh, but this one is very good. <laughs> it's very good, yeah. Maureen's one of their fans, you know. And they're going to be here actually in, fe in uh, February, I think. Uh, for I, I only find out through everybody else, I don't know. And we have a daughter, you know, she was up on the screen today, her and her husband doing all this. So, so, we're, so we're, really, we're really blessed in, in that way. But don't think that there were moments where both Phyllis and I were like, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You know, we, that's got to get move, and it happens in relationships. It doesn't happen in a, in a vacuum somewhere. You know, it's not we just say it over and over again, hopefully burp, it comes in. No. It happens when we are interacting with that boss that stinks. It happens when we're fighting as a couple. It happens when we have these friends that are disting us that we've known for years. It happens when our kids are prodigals. That's when these scriptures become alive in us, and that's why the relationships God puts us in are so important. Verse 5 through 8 says relationship, it speaks about this whole idea of, listen, my brothers, God has not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be, uh, but, uh, to be rich uh, in faith. You know, when, when, we were in, when I was in Africa, I was so amazed that, I mean, coming from suburbia New York, <laughs> there wasn't a thing I could relate to, not one thing, not one thing. We, we had our chairs. That was it. That was the uh, luxury of the time we were up there. I never forgave Nathan for that. No, but it was, a, it was an important time. And so we, we, here they are. They taught me more about my faith. Here I was, the teacher, and I was being taught right, left, and center about humility and brokenness and serving and loving, and it's just amazing to me. It was just amazing to me. In fact, uh, a cultural, there's a lot of cultural things there, but I, I remember... As I was getting to know them, and, and someone said, you need to learn some Swahili. Oh, okay. What? You know, I can hardly do English, you know, so here I am. You need to, you need to learn some Swahili. Like, and would you like me to go to school? Like, this is before the computers and everything. There was not like, I'll just let me download that app, you know. So I did. I learned, like, two words, you know, and I don't remember what they are. <laughs> it's like, one was like, praise God, and I guess the other one was, I don't know. So, but I remember, as soon as I did it, it was like, it was like, what? There was this attention that came to the surface, and I couldn't, I couldn't really, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I still, you know, I still couldn't speak any more than praise the Lord. That was it. But what it does, it conveyed a value to them. You're important enough for me to learn this. You know, I didn't, I didn't become fluent, unfortunately. But 
the things that we do. See, favoritism stops us from extending ourselves into the lives of those around us, the needs of those around us. It, if favoritism uh, stops, uh, when we stop favoritism, all that dreaming about, I wish it was this way, stops. And we're dealing with the, the things that are right in front of us. And so relationships that are, that are biblical need uh, need a relearning or repositioning of our understanding of how it relates to demonstrate the love of Christ, to speak uh, in the oneness of our marriage, to declare uh, that we love one another and so fulfill the love of Christ, and that we have relationships that need to be an avenue of a lot of things. A lot of things. See, if we see sick people, I don't know what their problem is. If we see this, I don't know what their... If we see this go on and on and on, then we are separating ourselves from God stepping in and saying, I need this relationship to be an avenue of healing. I need you to be an avenue of healing or hope or strength or value or vision or restoration or purpose, whatever it may be. Those things that God wants to use as he's transforming our life, when we remove favoritism from it, it's like a breath of fresh air. That <sighs> doesn't mean we remove respect. That's all there. We remove we honor. No, that's all there. So what happens is, is God starts unpacking those things that we put up as walls that we label as being a favoritism, of separating ourselves. I'm not going to associate there. I'm not going to associate there. And so once those walls start coming down, God starts stirring in us. So we are able, see, if we, if we stop, or say in our marriage, and, and we, we stop looking everywhere else and having these dreams of the way it's supposed to be one day, and we just look at that person across the table and realize this is the person that God wants, who God wants me to speak into and be spoken through, things begin to change because we're not distracted. Favoritism distracts us. Even in our, our relationships, not that, whether you're married or not, just relationships, favoritism is constantly doing this, look, look, looking around, right? Have you been in a place? I have where someone's talking to you, and you know they're not really talking to you. You just happen to be the body in front of them, and you happen to be there. So they're talking, and then the real person comes in. And they're talking, and you see their eyes do this. And you're like, I could probably just say, I'm just going to jump off the top of the building today and uh, scream, and uh, I think that's what my life is all about. And they'd be like, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, it's good to see you. And they're, Whoosh. Right? What favoritism does is it, it, it distracts us. We're, all, we're always looking for that person. I'm sure in business it can be that way. Oh, there's a president. There's a vice president. Let me just, you know, get over here. It happens in the church. And I've had people, I mean, I, I say it because I love our church, of course, but I've had people like knock, almost knock me over like they're waiting. Because, see, when I'm talking with somebody, I always know I'm talking to this person and I see the other person, so I'm doing both. I'm watching them one, like, okay, they want to talk to me next, so I, I understand that. And I watch people, like, near kill other, you know, like, knock them over. See, I, 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 I actually said, I was first. It's like, okay, are we dealing with anger here? What are we dealing with? <laughs> but favorite, what, what it does is it, it keeps separating us from what's going on. It distracts us. Favoritism distracts us from what God is doing. If we don't know the Lord, we could be distracted all day long. But if we want to be in God's place then that has to change. So in a marriage, the children can be favored over the spouse, thus devaluing the spouse, not because they're so sensitive, because it's just unbiblical. We can favor people even with the sm in the smallest range of our home. And I've had many times husbands say, my kids are more important than I am. My, the favoritism is towards the children, not to me as a husband. And we don't do a, you know, Poor me, but, it, but that dynamic can easily happen. And you see, the more strained the relationship is, the more that we, so we need relationships. So it's not that we fill it in with something. We'll fill it in with whatever it is. So again, even, um, even uh, relationships that are outside of marriage, friends, you know, if we're not getting that phone call from that person or that affirmation or I can't believe you didn't call me, blah, 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 all this stuff, we start saying, well, this group doesn't work, so I'll just expand my group and I start, because I feel like it should be a certain way. It's not that way. I start uh, connecting with other people, probably even outside of the faith. So Matthew 5.43 says, the bottom line is expanding, e expanding the one another. You have heard, as it was said, love your neighbor 
and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you might be the sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So, so what, what are we saying? We're saying we have to stop and say, God, you establish my connections wherever they are. You establish my parenting. You establish my marriage. You establish my friendship. You establish uh, either as an employee or an employer. You establish in my neighborhood. All of a sudden, this is not about me separating things out so it works for me. This is about me being separated out by Christ and work for him. So you may go down that block. You know, I, it was so funny. I was with my mom um, uh, she, because she's just now, she's up from Florida. She's here for a while. And we were... I don't know how we got into the conversation. We were talking about where we grew up, when, where I grew up. I grew up in uh, North Massapequa on Cedar Street, 270 North Cedar Street. Can you imagine? I don't remember what I did yesterday, but I can remember 270 North Cedar Street. I can remember my telephone number. Let's not go there. So, so we were talking, and, and this was the craziest thing. So I said, do you remember the Napolitanos? I, she goes, yeah. I said, that was a house that we didn't want to walk in front. That was kids. You know, kids, you're just stupid. So... The, the mother there was not a pleasant person. So we literally, as kids, drew big chalk lines on the street. It was a dead-end street. You know, so you, you were not allowed to walk in front of that house. You had, we, we decided, because they had whatever we decided they had, whatever the term was at the time. We, we just separated ourselves from them. And how easy it is to do that without drawing it on the concrete, you know? And how, what, what is it if maybe... God wants those people to know Jesus, wants us to be the best employee that I could possibly be, even though I really, I don't, I don't agree with the lifestyle of my, my, uh, my boss. I don't agree with what he says, the language he uses, but I want to be the best employee, the best husband, the best wife, the best wh whatever. So these relationships that are based, based on favoritism are ones that shut us off from the work that God wants to do in our lives. Now, here's what I would encourage you to do. Over this next week, you know, I may have all this seminary education, blah, blah, blah. I, my, my prayers are always simple. Show me, Lord, any favoritism in my life. That's my, so, so, show me any favoritism. Is there any place where there's favoritism that's directing my life away from what you want? And then put on your seatbelt because you're going to find out. You're going to be in a situation to go, well, okay, this is a weird situation. And the Holy Spirit will say, there's one, there's another. See, because sometimes we have to realize when we read this scripture, we just see it as such a simple, ah, I don't, I don't show favoritism. And, and maybe for the most part you don't. But if there's any favoritism that's being shown in your life that's hindering what the Holy Spirit wants to do, you're going to get it. And that's great. Because God doesn't just give us these rules and these statements. He gives us and then empowers us to be obedient to whatever it is. So if I say, God, I don't want to be, I don't want to show favoritism, show me. He steps right up with the Holy Spirit and he'll direct us through there and you'll get the fruit of it in a deep way. And so finally, I uh, just put this little tickle here to hopefully you'll be able to, you know, maybe spend some time doing it this week. Ask yourself, who do you favor? And that could be huge. Professional people, they could be racial issues. They could be all kinds of, like, who do I favor? And just be honest with yourself. Or maybe, you know, if you have a close relationship or your or your spouse, just say, who, who do you think I favor? They probably know better than you. They probably know better than you. And then reflect on how you favored someone that resulted in hurting somebody else. Now, we can do that pretty much if we go back to junior high. You know, we did that really well. But we do it as adults as well. How is my favor of one person hurt? somebody else. And then, what have you learned when you stepped up and loved your enemy? Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to ask this question. I don't really know if anybody would have an answer, but has anybody had that experience where there was someone that was, you would consider at some season of your life, their, your enemy, and then Christ moved in your heart and you restored a relationship with them? Anybody? I'd be just curious. Yeah. Yeah. Could, would you share it? Could you share it? You don't have to if you. Is your mother? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Amen.
Amen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's sure. See, and that's that's the important thing. You're, it's always it's always when you rise above it. This is with her mom, and she was just saying. She had some mental illness, wasn't medicated, and was pretty destructful. But once you came to know Jesus, you knew there was that pressure to overcome. Isn't it amazing how our own families can be enemies? They really can. They can be really destructive. Thank you for sharing that. Because that's, see, that's what it should be about. We should never just say, well, that's the way it is. You know, it's been that way our whole life. No, nope. you got to press in. And we all have those moments, those places, those relationships. So, so take hold of this word. Um, we're going to continue um, next uh, next Sunday as well. And uh, again, just uh, closing out, please, again, the couples weekend. I'm just not, I'm not just pressing it. I just want you, I don't want anybody to dis be disappointed. I want you to be able to be part of that. Lord, we are thankful for your word, your truth, and your promises. We thank you that as James writes these words, they stir us and they wake us up. And so, thank you. Show us this week if there's any place where our favoritism is stopping, is stopping you, Lord, from reaching those that you've called us to reach, then would you reveal that to us in the name of Jesus. Bless each one, we pray in your name. Amen. I bless you.